Okay, now I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator for this session, Ms. Shamila Sharma, personal finance enthusiast. Over to you, Ms. Shamila. Okay, thank you very much, uh, MC. So, a very good afternoon to everyone. Um, I actually faced a little bit of a risk uh, in terms of using digital and going fully online. My uh, tablet suddenly lost its battery. <laughs> uh, the other battery, basically. So, I was panicking a little bit, and this is going to be a question that I will ask the panelists later. Uh, what are the risks of actually going fully online? Um, and do we really need cash, like hard cash, right? <laughs> Okay, anyway, um, so in this panel, um, I hope we will be able to learn a lot uh, as we have done in other sessions as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we are joined with three very esteemed panelists and actually very intimidating to me as well uh, because I think they are all... Don't be scared. <laughs> Look at Mr. Money's smile. Don't I know, they are all like financial experts that I would love to learn from them as well. So we have Peter. Uh, also known as Mr. Money. He's the co-founder of Mr. Money TV. And Mr. Uh, Money TV is an edutainment channel that seeks to make savings and investment easy. Right. Okay, and then we have Desmond. Uh, he's the head of financial services at TNG Digital. So I'm quite sure you all know what TNG is, right? Touch and go. Um, so it's a e-wallet service provider. And finally, uh, we have Ken, and he's the country manager of Stash Away Malaysia, which is a robo-advisor. So can I ask you guys to clap harder and louder, please? <laughs> So, okay, over the next 90 minutes, right, I think our panelists will discuss the basics of financial management, share, I hope, their personal uh, finance journeys, uh, since we are actually targeting uh, students in this audience, um, and also highlight some of the benefits and risks of using technology in financial management. And finally, I hope we will be able to wrap up with uh, some strategies and tips that uh, students can use uh, in their financial management and using technology to assist. Uh, can we have the Slido QR code? Because we would like to encourage everyone to ask questions. Please help me out because my tablet may lose more battery and I will lose all my questions. Um, okay. All right. Um, and also we have three poll questions. Uh, can we have the first poll so that we can assess where everyone is in terms of using technology to assist you in financial management. Uh, one of the moderators in the earlier session said this looks like a stock market. This one a little bit lethargic, right? So, please, active participation, please. Come on, you wallet, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so it would seem like, you know, managing money and managing your, your finances, your, the banks uh, uh, appear to be the winner here. So uh, Desmond and uh, Ken, I think you have a heavy responsibility to uh, introduce alternatives to our audience. All right. Um, and with that, can we start with uh, Mr. Money? All right. Uh, your five minute introduction, please. Hello. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter. Uh, most of you will know me by Mr. Money. Yeah, so I run a channel called uh, Mr. Money TV. Yeah, so maybe I'll just give a very quick one. Uh, have you ever thought why is it called Mr. Money? Yeah. Okay. So it's not my name, Peter Yong. Uh, the reason being is because I believe ultimately Mr. Money is you guys. Yeah, one day you guys uh, will be much more familiar with money and more comfortable in making money decisions. 
And from what I believe, ultimately, when it comes to money, is this. You get better in money when you realize money is not the main thing. Yeah, so I'm going to elaborate on that uh, probably later as we have more conversation about it. But the sooner you realize that money is not the main thing, the better you can get with money. So that's about it. Thank you. That's really quick. Uh, Desmond. Hi everyone, my name is Desmond. I'm not as famous as Peter. I don't have a YouTube channel, neither do I have an Instagram. Um, I am uh, just a background myself. Uh, I always tell my friends I am in the fintech industry, but I'm definitely more fin than tech. Uh, sometimes I wonder why I'm in this role. Um, my background is um, commercial banker. I'm a commercial banker at large. Uh, I just joined Touch and Go Digital five years ago uh, to drive the financial uh, services of Touch and Go e wallet. Uh, some of you may know. Um, so, coming from a whole background of what uh, um, I was saying, uh, from a bank's perspective, so I went through that for many, many years um, and then jumping over to FinTech uh, to bring those kind of experiences there. So essentially, um, the whole background is the same. Fundamentally, I feel, uh, financial services, financial investments, insurance, everything, the fundamental basics will be the same. The only question is, how do you get it? Do you get it from brick and mortar? Do you get advice from Mr. Money TV or your conventional RMs? or from your apps and so on and so forth, or you get it from um, someone like us in, you know, in the e-wallet. Have you ever thought of you know, putting money in through the e-wallet, right? or putting money through some rural advisory and so on and so forth? So that's my role uh, that I manage. Uh, hopefully, we can get more Malaysians jumping on into this uh, financial ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Desmond and Ken. Hello, everyone, and thank you, MIM, for organizing this uh, great uh, seminar today, and to my fellow panelists for being here with me. Um, my name is Ken, I've been the country manager of Stash Away for about five going on six years. So the best thing about my role is I get to meet a lot of clients like, like you, young, old, men, women, working, not working, retired, all the rest. And they all have one goal, which is to become insanely wealthy so they don't have to worry about money anymore. Right? That, that, is, that is all our goal, it's a very human thing. right? But I will say through these five plus years that I've been in this role. And there's, there's never ever one time that is like, oh guys, this is the perfect time to invest. There's no risk, it's only upside, it's all sunshine and rainbows from here on out, and for sure you will get double digit returns and you'll be super happy. There's, there's no one time, right? We've been through Trump, been through COVID, uh, been through uh, China's tech collapse, been through uh, 2022, where bond markets and equity markets both tanked. Uh, we've also seen really good times. Actually, post-COVID, during the stimulus, uh, 2020 was, had amazing returns. Uh, last year, 2023, Magnificent Seven, tremendous returns. We've seen two crypto cycles, up and down, now up again, now got ETFs. So there's no one great time, right? So after, afterwards, when you ask questions, it's like, Kenna, or, or uh, uh, you know, if you ask any one of my, my fellow panelists here, there's no one great time to invest. Just start, get good habits, and then you'll be well on your way. Actually, I don't know who are the students here. I see everyone so mature looking. Are there actually students here? Got a two or knee, three or knee. The rest all no more hands. We have about 200 guys online. Oh, where? Where online? <laughs> online, bro. <I> <laughs> <laughs> okay, 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 okay. okay. That, that's why, that's why the fintech did not win just now. Hello online. <laughs> I didn't know it was online. Okay. Everyone is so well dressed, except me. So I thought, where are the students? Yes. Um, so yesterday they had a wardrobe uh, conversation as to Four, what they should wear. Personal branding all <laughs> to the nines already. Um, in order yeah. to, you know, encourage students to come to the good side and, and start uh, actually financially managing their money uh, from day one, right, as, as a student. Uh, but now that we are talking about financial management, uh, so Mr. Money, can you go back to basics and tell us what exactly is financial management when we are talking about mastering money through financial management? Uh, I think, like I say, the first thing that you have to understand is that it's really not about money. I think the biggest problem when we meet anyone, uh, first thing I want to start, I don't give financial advice. Yeah, hardly that. <laughs> I don't give financial advice, okay? I, I, I just give, make, I give financial advice. I just, uh, yeah, yeah, they give, okay? I don't. I only make entertaining YouTube videos. Uh, so if you find it entertainment, please watch it. Uh, and if there's some educational value, 
Uh, I hope you guys learned something of it. Uh, so over my years of meeting with many people talking about money, I do realize one thing is that a lot of people get it wrong because they start with the whole idea that it's all about growing your money. It's all about, oh, I want more returns. You know, I want to make a lot of money. So usually we'll add on a very simple question. Why do you want it for? How much is enough? Right? And people usually get very stuck with that suddenly. Like, eh? Um, why? Uh? Now, so then we go back to the first thing in the fundamental of managing money. It's really not about money. It's about your goal. It's kind of like today you want to go to, uh, say, one Wutama from here. What are you going to do? Are you going to take a bus? Are you going to take a car? Are you going to take Grab? What are you going to do? So those are the resources that you're going to use to get to the location. And money is just one of the resources. Now, conveniently, money is the resource that allows you to access many different resources. Does it make sense? Yeah? When you have money as a resource, you get to access many different options. But when you do not have money as a resource, you do not have much options. It's simple as that. Now, when you get the position of money right, that is where you start. And you say, hey, now as a fresh graduate, uh, assuming many of you are fresh graduate, assuming some of you are, are, are working for a while now, uh, depending on your goals, let's say you're a fresh grad, maybe your first few years you're talking about, I want to have at least 20,000 in my saving account, or uh, maybe what I want to do is to be valuable enough to climb up the career ladder. Now, if you're saying that, don't think about money first. Ask yourself this very simple question. What makes you climb up the career ladder? Definitely one of the first things that you need to do is be good with people. Right? So have you thought of actually setting aside a very small budget on a weekly basis to have a coffee with someone who is very much experienced than you, a senior or a management at work, and say, hey, I'm going to set aside a budget, meet my boss, or my senior managers, or whoever who's willing to teach me something and say, let me buy you a coffee and learn something about work. That coffee may not give you 20% return, but it can give you a lot more opportunities and financial return in terms of career opportunities than you have ever seen. Now, so you all get what I mean, right? In terms of as a fresh grad. Now, if you are someone who has been uh, in the mid of a career and you are thinking to yourself, is this really a job that I want to stay in? Now, you may have some finance, uh, you have some financial backing, you may have some savings saved up. Here's the time that you think to yourself, am I going to take the route of learning to be a full-time investor, dividend investing, right? Oh, by the way, if you see any dividend investing ads that uses our logo, it's not me, uh, it's a scam. We've been trying to reach out to Meta for a very long time, but they can't do anything about it. Yeah. Now, um, my point is, then you will have to ask yourself, if I want to make investment, my alternative income, okay, the first thing that you need to do is not ask yourself how much return you want, but how much are you willing to set aside to learn? 5,000? 3,000? 2,000? Maybe that's not the case. Maybe the case is, I want to do some sort of a freelance, right? Maybe I want to just do copywriting for people at the site because these days there's so many needs for copywriting due to social media. Well, how much time and how much money are you going to spend to learn copywriting? Maybe pick up a course on Udemy or on Coursera or something like that. Now, once you get these basics right, definitely the next thing is way more easier. It's a lot more easier. Okay? This is actually the hardest part to get right. This is the part that really requires you to sit down at night in your own bedroom, ask yourself the deep question, what do I really want in life? And don't worry, you don't have to get it right immediately. It can, it can be three years before you get it right. It can be two years before you get it right. Don't worry. People who seem like they got it sorted out actually had a long period of being lost. Yeah? Uh, I mean, think about Burger Lab, right? Uh, one of the popular burger chains in Malaysia. If you speak to him, for a good five years, he was actually wandering around, switching through different jobs before he decided building the burger chain is his life goal and purpose, right? So now, once you get that sorted out, experimenting and giving it a try, then the next part is pretty much easy, it is. Simple and easy. You ask yourself this very simple question, if it has to do with children education, how, where do I want to send my kids to? Okay, it's going to require me to set aside, say, uh, 400,000. There's plenty of calculator online. 
you don't even need to watch my video get there. Right? There's free resources everywhere. If you're thinking to yourself, uh, I want to have a certain amount of retirement, there's plenty of calculator out there. That's the part that's the easiest. So learning some basic calculation will come in later, and this will come down to the next thing uh, that I want to put it in. For most people out there, you probably do not have a lump sum amount of money that says, hey, I can just throw in this 500,000 and grow it to become my nest for retirement. Because if you are that person, you likely won't be asking this question. Yeah? So you have to appreciate the fact that you will be saving on a monthly basis. That's number one. Right? You'll be saving little by little. Now, for those of you, if you do not come from a wealthy background and if your family itself is not the kind that's very financial literate, uh, I want to draw you back to one last point that uh, the speaker just now Wong mentioned. Yeah, uh, people are afraid of losing, risk aversion. Okay? Now, I learned this lesson firsthand because I have the privilege of growing up in an urban poor family. Uh, and by growing up in an urban poor family, we have a very powerful habit, which is we have no savings. Everything is short term. Right? And because of that, you fail to envision what is long term. By telling me things like retirement, I will tell you that's a rich guy's responsibility and his trouble. It's not my trouble. My trouble is actually in the next two months, what am I going to do? Right? Yeah, you ask a fresh grad about lifelong career, his question to you is, tomorrow I got a job or not? <laughs> yeah, it's a very realistic thing, right? Now, but I want you to do this one thing if you're from this position, is to tell yourself that it's okay. And just give yourself that opportunity to have it for at least two months. What do I mean by that? You may be very tempted to not set aside the money because you say the amount is very little. How much can I do by setting aside 100 bucks? After three months, I only have 300 ringgit. It's not going to change my life. I want to encourage you to do that for one year. By the time you have that few thousand in your bank account, let's say it's thousand two or two thousand, by then you you just give yourself the opportunity to feel like you have that money with you. Ever since I had that ability to have some sort of a saving in my account and have that security, until today, you know, if you watch my video, you know I still drive Ativa. <laughs> yeah, because the more I think about it, like, I can't pull the trigger buy a better car because I just keep thinking I have excess cash every month. Yeah, so that is a very simple fundamental of investing that uh, hopefully gives you some practical way of applying. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Mani. I think there are a lot of insights there, and I'm very sure there are many burning questions. For example, how, as a student, uh, can you begin your network to get that mentor you're going to have your coffee with, right? Or, you know, when you are bootstrapping or when you have limited funds, how do you actually discipline yourself, right? Uh, in order to put aside, say, even that five ringgit or that 10 ringgit a month. Um, and, and with that, uh, Desmond, perhaps, you know, you could share how technology has made it easier or can empower students to put aside that little bit of money, uh, you know, on a monthly basis as suggested uh, by Mr. Mani. Thanks, uh, Shamila. What well, is uh, Mr. Money really can talk? Uh, I'll try to shorten it. <laughs> um, you know, I think I think we live in the age of technology, as I mentioned just now. Right? Everyone knows that, right? Uh, I'm not that young. I grew up in the '80s. Uh, no secret to my age, uh, where technology is not, you know, abound. You know, it's not everywhere. Anything to do with money, you literally go to a brick and mortar uh, or get the insurance agent to kind of talk to you, and so on and so forth. And I was just reflecting on this question. Um, and that's the reason why we do what we do, actually, right? Because, you know, even until today, uh, you know, I, I would actually say unfortunately, uh, when you want to access money items, most of the time, investment, even insurance and things like that, most of the time, it comes with, quote, unquote, a premium, right? If you want to buy your first unit trust, you go to a bank. Chances are, chances are, I'm not saying all like that, Chances are they will not really serve you. It's just going to buy three thousand ringgit. Chances are, right? I used to for one, so I know. Um, they would, they would say, ask for ten thousand ringgit, or you want to join my preferred or, or private wealth, or all this kind of stuff, right? So not many people will do that. So that's point number one, right? Um, in the advent of technology, it's about accessibility, 
And when I say accessibility, it's probably two parts. Number one, being able to access it easily and being able to access it at the level where any of the users can access it. I'll give you an example, and, and this is not a shameless plug, right? One of the things that we strive for in Touching Your E-Wallet, for example, is really to try to democratize as much as possible, right? So we partner. So actually, I'm not, I'm not too concerned about the banks, actually, to, to tell you the truth. We partner with banks. We don't hold any products. So we partner with banks, fund houses, and so on and so forth, right? I mean, we can also partner with Statue Way one day. You don't know, right? Because we don't own the products. But the fact of the matter is what we try to do with our partner is to try to democratize it. And our principle is very simple. Of course, as an app, it's accessible 24-7, right? That's one point. Branches are not, right? Um, and we would like to pride ourselves that, you know, what we call the UI, UX, the experience is easier. We break down jargons of investment, you know, make it a little bit more layman. Because what we believe in is that this rank of society can understand what they are investing in, can reach that investment product, i.e. a 10 ringgit investment, that would also mean the entire country can reach. Right? But if you talk about normal, conventional way of doing it, you go to a bank, you gotta wait for the bank to be open. I always joke about this. When you go to the bank, you triple park. I come from Subang, Taipan. You have to triple park just to go to the bank. Hopefully MPHA don't kind of tow away your car. You take a ticket to go and see them, right? But all this true technology is at your fingertips right now, right? I, I'm, a, I'm a user of such way, for example. It's all through your uh, fingertips. I invest in my own app as well. It's through your fingertips. Education is in YouTube right now. Of course, please listen to Money TV and not other, other people, right? Uh, you, know, you know what I mean? So the fintech has come to a point where it's accessible and easily attained by everyone. And I think that's the, the, the beauty of it. Because if everyone can do it, everyone can do it, right? If the masses, if the not so literate can understand the jargons and so on and so forth in terms of uh, uh, investment, that means the whole you know, country, the whole segment of users can, uh, can achieve that, right? So that's, I think fundamentally that's, that, that's how the role of technology I think it should bring. Um, so yeah, that's the point. Well, thank you very much, uh, Desmond. I think I totally agree with uh, FinTech actually. I think de demystifying some of your investment terminology. Uh, it took me a CFA to understand some parts, and I still don't. Uh, so, uh, on that, uh, Ken, can you maybe provide uh, you know an introduction to what Stash Away is and how it has you know allowed uh, robo advisors, for instance, allowed for greater accessibility, as uh, Desmond uh, mentioned. Uh, thanks. Uh, so Stashaway is an investing platform. I think it's as plain and simple as that. We allow people to deposit money and then we invest it in uh, a portfolio that is global and has many asset classes within, so you're truly diversified. Um, I really like what Desmond said earlier about access because before this, your choices were really, especially when it comes to funds, right? Your choices were really a, a very expensive unit trust. Unit trust charges 5% upfront and then 2% management fee, so that's 7%. We charge about 1% all in. 1% versus 7% is not just huge compared to each other. That's like a 90% discount. But let's say in any given year, you get like 10% return, right? 7% of that is like bloody, bloody like 70% gone. You only get 3% return. And you might as well get 3% from the FD. So why are you taking equity risk for only 3%? And I, I, I say this now because some of you may not even know that your fees are so high. And maybe when you review your statement, and this is all true story, 10 years, 15 years in, you really actually properly sit down and look at what you've paid in terms of fees. You look at that column of fees paid 5% or 2%, uh, 5 plus 2, right? Then you're like, wow, all this time. And you have no one else to blame but yourself because you've already signed on the dollar line, you've already committed, you've already transacted with the agent, whether they serve you or not, don't know. Unit trusts are very expensive. So I believe that Stashway's main value add to Malaysia and to, to the other markets that we're in is to lower the barrier to entry, especially when it comes to cost. So when I did a market study, uh, a study on how much fees we in Malaysia have saved everyone, say we, if we had taken the deposits that you have given us and we charge 5%, we have saved Malaysians 90 million ringgit. 
Imagine that. 90 million ringgit we have kept in the pockets of the client. And the worst thing is some clients don't even realize that they're paying this amount. So I think what Stashway has managed to do is deliver tremendous value to the investor. And I think that's, that's in this world of technology, at least do yourself a favor and look for something which gives you much more affordable fees. I would also say Stashway helps you invest globally. Malaysia is a great country. I live here. I'm never going to move. People ask me to go to Singapore. I'm like, no, I don't work so hard. I'm going to be here. But Malaysia has its own set of issues. And one of it is that if you wanted to invest in the Malaysian stock market or you wanted to maybe have your ringgit not depreciate so much, you'd be, you'd be facing tough times. The local market will not perform unless you're a God-level stock picker. If our, our index has been flat for the last 10 years. In fact, it's like minus 1, minus 2% compounded over the last 10 years. But if you're a really good stock picker, sure, but not everyone's a good stock picker. So what we have unlocked for everyone is the ability to invest in passive ETFs through a portfolio which we manage for you very easily, right? I think that's, that's also one, one, one key thing. And also the weakening ringgit, right? Like over the last 10 years, our ringgit has depreciated 45%. That's 3.5% per annum over the last 10 years. Political instability is one thing. Gro global macro factors is one thing. But facts are facts. Our ringgit has slid 45% in the last 10 years. So with all our home buyers, right, investing in, uh, in, in real estate, cash in the bank, you know, even EPF only has 30% overseas, PNB, ASB only has 10 or 20% overseas, you owe it to yourself to invest globally, right? So I think Stashway allows you to invest in a diversified manner, intelligently managed, uh, all, overseas, all for very, very low cost, right? Another thing, um, last thing I'll say about technology is just to add a little bit to what Desmond said about access. In terms of you kids, right, none of you meet real people in real life anymore. All of you use Bumble or Coffee Meets Bagel, right? So in terms of managing your money, it will be digital as well, right? You won't be managing the way your parents have invested. So you, as a digital native, all that, no need to say, it's a given, yeah? So uh, I don't know, I, I've never used Bumble, but I'm pretty sure it's worked for you guys, so that's it. On, for the record, right? For the record. For the record. I love you. Okay. Um, all right. So I do see some film representative here uh, where, you know, Ken mentioned about unit trust and fees. Um, um, welcome any comments that you may have uh, during the discussion about unit trust. Um, in order to, uh, you know, move away from uh, touch and go and also stash away, so we are not seen as, uh, you know, promoting these two uh, apps. Perhaps, uh, Mr. Mani, you can also share what other apps are there out there that students or, or young adults uh, can access? So here's the time that I mentioned all their competitors, right? <laughs> <laughs> How much you want to? By all means, by all means, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Touch and go say, I'm not scared. Because uh, you're all in the wallet already. Nothing to fight. <laughs> uh, I think... Uh, you don't really need me to mention, right? I think you know, like, there's Versa, there's, like, Arise, and so on. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff. Uh, there's even, like, stock investing today is made much more simple. There's Mumu, there's M+. Plus. Uh, I heard Bibu also coming in, right? Uh, there's a million and one thing. And the truth is, these days, with the internet, you can access to almost anything in the world, right? Uh, so going back to the idea of the technology is... I would say, remember just now I mentioned that the first thing is about your goal, right? So it's kind of like the idea that today if you want to build a house, then you acquire the tools to build the house. Then the question is what kind of house you want to build, right? So uh, the technology actually is really fantastic because it allows you to access into so many different tools today. Now, it's fantastic. In my opinion, it's fantastic. When was the last time that someone can, you know, just buy an ETF with 50 bucks. That never happened for most of our, uh, if you're an 80s kids, right? It never happened before until Stash Away came about and then after all the other guys came about as well, right? My two, all these kind of people, right? Now, my, my point is this, um, technology is technology. However, there's one issue. For most of the people out there, it's called an information overload. 
I've seen a lot of people dealing with many, many different apps and they come to a point, they just don't do anything. Why? Because you want to just buy one product alone, you're comparing five to six different apps and it becomes so tiring, you rather just keep your money back in the bank account and not do anything. Uh, those who are in the financial planning field, I think you understand what I mean, right? Uh, and that's one of the reasons why until today, a servicing, a servicing agent or a servicing financial planner helps people to sort out their part. So, I, I mean, since technology also should help the financial planner say a bit of stuff, huh? Yeah, but, but that's true, that's true. That's really, really true. And you will see this again and again, especially when the person become more and more wealthy and don't mind paying for a certain fee, they just do not want the trouble. Now, go good, go bad, as usual. If you just fully trust without doing your own homework, you could get yourself into trouble as well, yeah? But generally, that's the case. So my point that I want to make is this. Uh, there are many, a million and one apps out there for you to use. Today, the world is your oyster. Everything is at your fingertip. The question is this, before you approach any of them, make sure you get yourself educated. Try to understand every single investment. Now, you'll be asking me right now, then how to understand? Because there's so many things, right? I would say the first place that you should always start is learn how to evaluate a stock. I'm not asking you to invest. I'm asking you to learn how to evaluate. Why is it so? Whether you are investing in ETFs, whether you're investing in unit trusts, whether you're investing in bonds or anything that you can think of, most of the time you're investing in a business. Evaluating stocks teaches you how to evaluate business. And by understanding how a business runs, it gives you a better understanding in selecting the different funds. Let me give you an example. When you understand how NVIDIA works, right? I'm not recommending NVIDIA as stock. Huh? Please don't go and cut out and then say, hey, Peter, please don't do these kind of things. Huh? Now, when you understand how NVIDIA works, the semicon industry works, the AI industry works, when someone approaches you and say, I have this new technology fund that focuses on AI, you instantly know what the person is talking about. The only difference is they are investing in a basket of similar stocks, which is a group of these kind of stocks. Ah, right? Now, then you have much more confidence to put your money into these kind of funds. Does it make sense? Yeah. So my point here is this. There's a million and one tools out there today. The benefit is you have direct access. But the disadvantage is this. If you do not want to spend time studying about different things, what happens is that you're going to be even more confused. So that's all. Sorry, Shamila, I have to hijack this. Um, not, not doing any sales speech because I do want to agree with uh, what Peter is saying, right? Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to address, I don't know where the camera is to the to students. I, I think it's probably there. Uh, <laughs> To, to the students, actually, um, and I think either Shamila yourself or the previous uh, MC was saying experts, um, panel, and so on and so forth. But I would like to probably say on behalf of my fellow panelists, no one is an expert overnight. Okay, you start from somewhere. You learn. You learn through your way. Okay, that's point number one. I think what's important uh, as students or as anyone think about investment or trying to start investment, I definitely agree. There's a wealth of app information and so on and so forth. Um, fundamentally, you will never be able to understand every single investment tool. Let's not kid yourself. Okay? If I'm addressing, I, mean, I, I know I'm looking at uh, uh, not, not all students here, but I always like to, like, like to ask this question, even to my own staff, right? Um, how many people actually invest? Actually, if you don't mind me asking, participate, right? Uh, if you don't want to just put up here, don't have to put it all the way high, right? So who in this audience right now invests? So if my rough calculation is about 40%, okay? I don't know about the students, but I reckon will be slightly lower, right? And the next question I always ask is, who in this room or in the call puts money into Bitcoin? Right? And I'm looking at people who the first hand didn't come up. Okay? Investment, no, they didn't. Bitcoin, they did. This is, this is my concern, and I want to address it to the students, right? I'm not saying Bitcoin is good or bad. I'm not giving advice. 
I'm giving a fact that you need to remember three things. Accessibility, education, for sure. But can you educate yourself for everything in the world under the sun? Even today, after being a banker so many years, I cannot really explain bond, to be very honest with you. Right? There's so many things. But try to understand the fundamentals. I think that's important. Right? Secondly, um, I would do like to say, if you are thinking about investment, and you're thinking about investing through the apps and so on and so forth, please ensure you go through a platform or a channel that's regulated. Right? That's as much advice as I give in the investment space in Malaysia. Right? Try as much as possible. Security Commission is there, Bank is there. All this regulation is in place to take care of our needs. Right? Um, thirdly is start. Right? Um, there's so many things, and to, to Ken's earlier point, there is a reason why most investment apps, most bank fund houses charges a service charge and, and so on and so forth. There's actually a reason behind it because there is a cost to serve. Right? There is a cost for, a, for people to look at the funds, to move the funds within the basket around, right? to make sure optimal return and so on and so forth. I think even uh, you know, EPF have a you know, group of people that does investment in that way. Right? So yes, but the advent of technology has made it cheaper for people to invest right now. Right? So capitalize on that as well. So these, these three points I want to leave for you, for you all to think about, right? as you think about starting the investment. Uh, one last point is, the question just now is, when do you start investment? The joke answer is, yesterday you should start investment, but I think it's really never too late. Today, tomorrow, just start. Right? And the beauty of it right now is what we have in Malaysia, and uh, um, uh, Peter mentioned this, there's even stockbroking right now, that you can invest as low as 10 ringgit for a fractional share. All this is made available right now. So. 10 ringgit, 20 ringgit, 30 ringgit, even if the market tanks tomorrow, you lost one and a half frappe or latte. Right? Not like those days. You buy one lot, you, you lose sleep. Right? So it's actually a very good time to start uh, now. Right? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Desmond. Um, can I just ask the organizers to put up the slido code for the Q&A and also maybe to flash out the question and answers? I'm showing my digital illiteracy here because I can't seem to operate uh, the tablet that was given to me. Um, can we flash out the... Uh, yeah. Okay, so do you use an e-wallet app? All right, that's yes. great. Uh, <laughs> you're on the right track there, touch and go. <laughs> um, how about the questions? Can you flash out any questions? Okay, I think the first question is, is a good one. Uh, because we are targeting students and I would like to bring back the conversation to something a bit more basic. So for those in their 20s and 30s, should they take money out of EPF account 3 to invest in StashAway or other licensed online platforms for better returns? I think Ken, perhaps? I would say for now that uh, account 3 or account flexible is still a very new development. So for now, uh, what they're indicating is that the return will be similar to the other accounts as well, 5 6%. In the future, I don't know what the, those returns will be, but assuming it's 5 6%, just don't touch it. Like, it's better to just leave it in there. Of course, you can optimize, but come on, 10%, you can take out a grand, you can take out two grand, but like, it's not that much in the grand scheme of things. Um, it's, I, I, I can see where this is coming from, but like, I would say it's easier to leave it. I also say it because 5 6% capital guaranteed with our, our pension fund, it's a really good deal. 5-6% consistently is pretty hard to beat. Without the volatility, very hard to beat. You need to basically take it out the money and tell yourself, I want to take more risk. And risk means volatility, right? So when you look at what you could put out there, including stash away, you really have to think two, three times because are you willing to take the volatility along the way and accept certain paper losses or maybe even real losses if you're down, right? So as it relates to EPF, I would say just leave it there. It's probably simpler as well. Um, but of course, whatever you have to invest, um, use it to also tag to your, to your retirement so that you can supplement your retirement when you do stop working. Just now there was a really good slide when EPF was showing your lifetime earnings. Then when you stop working, you just, it just drops. <laughs> then you rely on EPF. The idea here is to drop and then got EPF and then some cushion on top. Your other investments, whatever they may be, to also supplement your EPF uh, 
uh, if a fund, right? EPF fund is not the be all and end all. It, it can't be, right? So do supplement uh, with uh, other investments as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so Desmond, uh, a question for you. Uh, in terms of e-wallets, right? Can you use it for budgeting purposes or expenses? I mean, so far, I think in terms of financial management, uh, Peter mentioned the three different aspects, right? Your budgeting, your expenses, and of course, your investing. How about budgeting and uh, expenses and, and managing your expenses? Yeah, I think, um, I won't spill the beans, but, but very soon, you see, in our e-wallet, we will have a a place where you can actually see, I, I mean, it's good to see just now the earlier slide, 60 plus percent of people or the students reply that they use e-wallet, which is all digital cash anyway, right? Um, so we will be launching something soon uh, um, as an MVP. You can actually track all your expenses um, in one place. So that is at least from an expense tracker perspective, you know where you're spending. And actually one of the biggest things that happened in the e-wallet space right now, I'm sure all of you uses it, is, is P2P, right? Rather than having a hey, OU24 ringgit, 70 cents, da, 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 I give it to you, it's all P2P. That is also captured. Right, so that's also telling you your money trail. So I think that's the first step, at least to be able to help our users have their money trail. Right, uh, gone are those days you try to reconcile today. Hey, what happened to my money and things like that? So it's all there if you use it. Right, uh, what we like to hopefully achieve uh, in in uh, in due time is that the tool can also be used to a certain extent to give the users the ability to then. Um, set certain, like, you know, the, the whole thing, mastering your own financial uh, transactions, right? How much you want to be alerted if you are over, but overspending in certain categories, you know, so on and so forth, right? Um, I, I can't find a very good word for it, but rudimentary way of doing it, but we believe that's a start, right? Again, um, again, not a shameless plug, it's just a fact. We serve Malaysian, right? We don't serve certain segment and things like that. So we want to cater to everyone, and we believe by starting there, as your transactional tool, because you will spend anyway, right? Rather than using cash, if you're not using credit card, you spend through the wallet, you can see everything from there. So we, we are intending to put in some budgeting tools for you to be able to track it, for you to be able to track and maybe curb certain transactions, right? So on and so forth. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, there's a question, please. That's testing. Hi, good evening, good afternoon, guys. Uh, fabulous content from all of you. I've been using Stash Away, Touch and Go, and I've been following uh, Mr. Money's TV's podcast as well. So uh, I'm YJ from Quad Pension Fund, so I'm doing fixed income right now. So I have a question to Peter. Uh, yeah, so I've been following your podcast for a while right now, and I've been uh, growing thanks to the channel itself. So I'm from insurance, cryptocurrencies, investment, and etc. I've been following you guys quite uh, quite closely. So the que uh, this question is a bit sidetracking. So the question is, what is your view on the US uh, economics market? And do you think that cryptocurrency will continue to fly to the moon post halving? So again, history never repeats itself, but it often rhymes with US uh, Feds doing uh, quantitative tightening and liquidity so suppressed. Do you think cryptocurrency still stands a chance to fly to the moon? Right. Thank yeah, you. Yes, Peter, do tell us. Do tell us where the <laughs> crypto You're is putting me in a spot here, more. brother. <laughs> yeah, uh, first thing I want to say, thank you very much. Uh, because of you, I got a job. Lah. Yeah, because you listen to my podcast, so I got a job, right? If not, I wouldn't have uh, any job. Uh, so, <clears throat> in terms of the US market, in terms of uh, cryptocurrency, uh, I honestly, again, take you a pinch of salt. Uh, I'm not an advisor. I'm not an investment expert. Uh, I'm just sharing my thoughts and I'm going to give you a very vague thoughts because <laughs> that's just how it should be. Uh, you can think about it this way, US is the biggest market in the world. Yeah, uh, Whenever US drops, the whole world drops together. Whenever US goes up, the whole world goes up together. Now, whether is it, some people today are arguing that uh, whether US is really that relevant or not, uh, in my opinion, it doesn't really matter because that's what most of the population believe. As far as I'm concerned, that's what, how most of the investors behave. Whether they believe or not, because they know that when US goes up, we all should go up. When US go down, we all will go down. So whether they believe or not, or they agree or not, their money will be very honest. Now, one of the best things that uh, I've learned in life is that you want to know the truth, follow the money. Money don't lie. Yeah. And in fact, that's how a lot of, uh, a lot of people get caught when you follow the money trail. 
Yeah. <laughs> and this is the argument of a, of a technology that uh, it offers a solution for more transparency, but also it's, uh, it's a deterrence for people who want to do any funny things. No, uh, and this comes down to the next part when you're asking about, uh, if I talk about US economy, that's as much as I can say. Whether I the market's going to go up or go down, uh, we do not know. Yeah, if I know, I wouldn't be sitting here. I'll be a very, very rich uh, investor because every round I'll just go all in and make myself very rich. Yeah, I won't come for any talks or anything. I'll hide in my own room. Yeah, uh, so likely whatever I say, please do not follow. Uh, but my thoughts again are, uh, US election is coming. And if you think about any logical sense, uh, most presidents who wants to get elected wants to have a nice economy during that time. Unless they can't control. For example, UK. <laughs> and, and that's why uh, there's going to be a snap election very soon, right? Yeah, so these are just logics, right? Now, uh, interest rate up or down, uh, reading through the tone of uh, Fed chairman, you can roughly make a wild guess. Uh, I don't think he may agree, but he's definitely hands tied to not say certain things that's too unoptimistic, let me put it this way, right? Um, now, whether will the money follow? That's a question where the market investor, do they respond? And that's the only one thing that people cannot do anything. I think you can ask any policymaker who actually exists in this room or even beyond this room, right? Uh, policymakers can only do as much. The rest still comes down to investors' behavior. Number one, the main investment fund, uh, for example, pension fund, all those will be the first movers. Subsequently, the more uh, institutional investors in US, it's even larger amount of hedge investors and so on. Then the retail market follows. And usually when the retail market follows, that's when you want to be a little bit more careful. So um, now let's go to the next last part, which is a cryptocurrency. Uh, I don't think I'm in a good position to talk about it again, but I'll just put it up front that I'm a crypto investor and I'm, I'm quite a believer of it. Uh, how much? Don't ask me. Yeah. Uh, but my point is this. Will the history repeat itself? I really do not know. Uh, if you think that it's going to repeat, then please go with your conviction. If you don't think it's going to repeat, then just don't do it. But there's one thing that I always believe, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And if you want to go all in, or as much as you want to go in, just remember this one thing. A black swan... It's called black swan because you never know that it's going to happen. If you think it's going to happen, then it's likely not going to happen. So that's why it's called black swan. And that's the, that's the animal that any investors fear the most. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's as much that I can say uh, in terms of these two things. Yeah. Okay, so Ken, uh, you're staying away from the crystal ball, huh? <laughs> Okay, I mean, we are talking about not putting everything into one basket, right? So uh, we, we have talked about quite a lot on crypto, and I would like to uh, ask Desmond and Ken, uh, in terms of other asset classes, we've heard about equities, we heard about uh, bonds, but what sort of asset classes are available on your platforms, for instance, like touch and go? Are there like money market funds uh, for stash away? I, I believe your underlying asset is uh, ETF. Uh, so maybe you can talk a little bit about these two asset classes that are available. Yeah, maybe I'll go first. Um, so for Touch and Go e-wallet, what, what we do have uh, currently on platform is uh, the more conventional ones. We have uh, uh, unit trust uh, that cuts across uh, equities, fixed income, you know, uh, growth and so on and so forth. Uh, we have not gone into anything too exotic as yet, uh, to be honest. We, we, think, we did think about crypto and so on and so forth. But again, our convictions are not there. Uh, largely because of uh, as what I mentioned earlier, right? we are here to serve Malaysia. Uh, and we believe that uh, certain things, uh, mass majority of Malaysians are not really ready. So we also don't want to put it up front you know, because if it's too easy and they don't understand it, right? we, we take the responsibility. But Unit Trust has been around. We understand we work with reputable companies. Uh, you know, uh, you know, he mentioned PNP and things like that. So we recently launched uh, ESMB as well, which many Malaysian does it. And the reason why we do it is very simple. Again, to back to my principle, it's accessibility. 
right? Uh, if you don't know, and this is again a shameless plug that is benefiting everyone actually. For those of you who are online, you don't know. Uh, conventionally, if you want to open an ASMB account, you have to go to their branches. We have just launched and we are the first one that you can actually op open through our e-wallet. Right? Anyone 18 and above, you can open. Again, is it something out of the ordinary? Is it something that, that you cannot do? No, you can. You just need to go and park at the branch. But the fact of money right now, you can do through the e-wallet 24-7 to open it. Right? So what we double in right now are things that we um, can go behind that we are convicted to. Doesn't mean that ETFs and, and, and cryptos are not good. Um, it's just that we believe it's not the right time for us to go through that. Uh, what we do right now is to work with our partners to make available this product that conventionally people cannot access it so uh, easily. Uh, we are and we will be launching um, uh, certain trading products as well coming soon. Um, so essentially for us, it's really be a platform that you can bring these products to Malaysia. I think it's really, as it relates to asset classes, it's, it's all choices you make and things that you invest in and ultimately it expresses in risk and return. So what ultimately is in there is actually very academic. Lah. So it's ultimately whether the risk matches the, the return. High, re high return and when you look at excessive risk or so, it might not be attractive from a risk-adjusted basis, meaning that if you wanted that really high return, you need to sit through the volatility. So don't be too fixated on specific asset classes or, or anything like that. Just because it's ultimately, at the end of the day, it's about risk and return, right? So coming back to asset classes, if you read Bloomberg or Financial Times or listen to BFM, you will likely only hear about the big winners and the big losers. It will come into your consciousness when it's like S&P hits all-time high or yen hits all-time decades low against the US dollar or gold hits all-time high. Ethereum is up 20% because the ETF is going to launch. Let me ask you this. What's wrong with just holding it all? What's wrong with having everything in your portfolio so that certain things go up, certain things go down, but by and large, you're diversified, hence taking the, the, a lot of risk away, and having a very decent return year in, year out. That's what we try and do for clients. You, do, you take out the guesswork, you spread out your money, whatever pops, great, you're in a position to take benefit of that, but we have put it in a way where such that you don't have to worry, worry so much about the short-term volatility. So last year and continuing this year, AI is such a big trend. And you can see this through all the Magnificent 7 stocks. And if you buy, let's say, just the NASDAQ uh, uh, index through an ETF, right? Tech-heavy NASDAQ. It has 10-year compounded returns of 17%. That's amazing. 17% over 10 years compounded, you know. Means, on average, every year it does 17%. Then you do your rule of 72, like you double your money very fast. So, my point is, to deserve that 17% over the last 10 years, you will need to sit through some very tough times. In 2022, for example, NASDAQ went down over 30%. Are you willing to sit through in that 10 years to ultimately deserve that 17% on average? That's really up to you, right? So, I also want to say this uh, very apparent truth, right? No one invests to lose money. But invariably, a lot of people do, right? Why? Because they, it's like whack-a-mole, right? Like something's going to get hot, then you know, I wanna, I'm in. I'm in in this and this and this and this. By the time it reaches most people, it's already too late. So instead, focus on a lot of the things we said earlier, right? Like education, all the rest. And then looking to the long term. Have a diversified portfolio that is in a lot of these things that we've talked about already. Practice good behavior by being disciplined and staying in for the long term. Then you take out a lot of the guesswork. So much studies done on the benefits of dollar cost averaging and long term investment. But no, you know, the social media and every, all the news, they want you to trade. They want you to go in and out. They'll tell you about the hot stuff. Hot stuff up, hot stuff down. So a lot of it is non noise. And if in 10 years someone started investing today, and if 10 years you guys make money and you see me on the street, then you can buy me a coffee or beer or something, right? So. I, I do have a question, follow up question, but before that, can we uh, flash the questions, please? 
uh, while waiting for that, uh, you know, you're talking about concepts like dollar cost averaging. Um, can technology help to take away that emotion of volatility? I mean, for instance, is there something that we can do in terms of automation? Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Money was talking about putting aside money every month. You know, is there, it, does technology empower students or young adults to create that discipline? In my opinion, uh, yes and no. Yes, because it makes it easy for you to invest more regularly, but no as in it continuously pop up in your face and it makes you more for more. Yeah. So uh, what do I mean by that is that, uh, you, know, you know the idea of delayed gratification? Yeah, I think uh, that's one thing that everyone has to learn when it comes to investing. Yeah, it's the more return you want to get, the more you need to delay your gratification. Yeah, uh, why is it much more easy for someone to, you know, um, like you think about it, uh, there's a lot of Asian rich people get rich because of property. Uh, and they'll tell me that property make a lot of money. But if you do any real calculation, you'll find that property is not the one offering you the best return. Now, but why people get rich with property? Because most of them cannot sell and they don't sell. Okay? Now, another thing is this. Do you ever walk into a property area, there's a big board, right? They keep telling you what's the last transacted price. No, right? Yeah, it doesn't happen. That's what the stock market does. Every day it tells you who's offering what price. It doesn't even need to be transacted. The fellow joker, you go and put up one dollar, you go and put up 80 cents. Then the word is there 80 cents. You also panic already. Oh, someone think my asset is worth 80 cents. Uh, right? yeah, then you panic. Then you're like, okay, I better sell now before it goes to 40 cents. Right? Uh, but in terms of property, it doesn't happen. There's no such thing. So, likelihood, your friends won't go and tell you because most of your friends are definitely not a contradicting person or, or confrontational. Okay, hey, your property lose money. Uh. We don't like to be bearer of bad news. Uh, so chances are you just hold on to it for like 20 years. And even though you make a very dismal return of 3%, you feel fantastic because the amount is big. Yeah. But think about it this way. Ultimately, who gets rich is really not about how smart you are in calculating the number. It's how much you can delay your gratification and not see that return right now. So like what... Ken said earlier, right? 17%. Yeah. Do you know why people lose money? Because that one year when they see it drop by 10%, they keep calling and say, hey, 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 lose money, huh? why you make me invest in this thing? Huh? Yeah. And after that lecture, go up already, hey, hey, why you let me sell huh, today? Hey, bro, everything also you say. <laughs> that's why you're a financial planner and all these guys not easy huh, when you keep calling them. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's all I can say uh, in terms of does it help? Uh, so I think the easy thing is just... Uh, after you invest, if you plan to dollar cost average, just delete the app. <laughs> I think, um, you know, there's an old saying, uh, easy come, easy go, right? Uh, I think technology is also somewhat like that. It's easy to do it, therefore it's also easy to undo it, right? Uh, again, back then, <laughs> revealing all my ages, um, back then we don't buy a share, you call your remiser, let's say you want to buy a US stock, you call your remiser in the morning, Say, I'll put in an order for you, 9.30, you wait. If you, do, you don't you want to watch uh, Bloomberg, whatever, you only know tomorrow whether you, you strike, blah, 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 right? All those kind of stuff. So it's, it's not so easy. Also, to a certain extent, your stress level is lower because you can't do anything about it, right? But what, what Peter mentioned is true, right? It's right now, it's easy, and it's also easy. I, I look at, okay, I must admit, I also look at uh, big, uh, you know, crypto a little bit, and I do find myself checking every day. Is it red? Is it green? Is it red? But you know, is it really healthy? But at the end of the day, I think, to me, the answer fundamentally is technology is there to help. It all depends on the person's ability to master and use the help given, I feel. Dollar cost averaging is a very good terminology. It's a very good practice that I'll encourage everyone to try. But that also means you need to have discipline. Because it's easy for me to sign up for dollar cost averaging uh, you know, auto investment for you know, 100 ringgit, 200 ringgit every month is also easy for me to just cancel it with one click. You get what I mean? So it's really about the discipline of the person and the technology is really just there to enable you to do it. Anything to add, Ken? 
Yeah, don't really, I mean, dollar cost averaging is, is one of those ways that you can spread out your, your risk in terms of your entry. And we have a feature called direct debit that you can set up and go about doing these things. If you, if you want to go take a step further, since the gents here already talked a lot about uh, DCA, there's this other term called value cost averaging, which I have practiced and I found it to be a very useful way of coping with a lot of episodes where, where the market swings down, right? And then you, at least there's something for you to do to scratch that itch and it's something like a programmatic response so that every time you, you see a headline, right? S&P falls most in five months or most year to date or worst start to the year since 1970 or something, just put money in, in, in whatever platform you're in. Because, especially if it's exposed to the US. So whenever you see all these headlines, just put money in. Because you'll be picking up uh, equities or whatever it may be at a very low point. Whenever you see those volatile charts, right? Like, don't you wish you scooped it in the dip, right? So this is your way of doing it. And you say, what have I done about the situation? Stop feeling anxious. You've already done something, right? And re research have, has also shown that if you do this, naturally you will pick up more shares uh, at a cheaper price and you will come up with a better return as well. So if you're good at dollar cost averaging already, try value cost averaging. Okay, uh, so thank you. Um, there's a question on data breach, and I think, uh, you know, having heard the benefits of technology, accessibility, low cost, easiness, you know, of access, uh, it's 24 seven. Um, let's talk a little bit about the risk, right? Uh, so Desmond, I think this uh, question is uh, probably addressed to you. I feel like I'm signal out. Um, the use of e-wallet often have data breach. Uh, if I may, um, how should I say, correct a perception? Uh, uh, as far as we are concerned, touching your wallet, we have not had a data breach uh, yet, uh, but I think ever as well. Um, I think it is it is true, right? Data breaches, risk to to the platform, and so on and so forth. Um, all these are very real, right? It, these are all real risks that we face every day. Um, and as the e-wallet, we hold uh, money for Malaysians, right? Uh, we take it with the utmost um, urgency for all these kind of risks. Um, so. It's, you know, payments can be easily fake. It's quite true. I give you one simple, very practical thing, right? Um, uh, what we face uh, um, these days, right? I give you an example of merchants. You want to buy a pack of nasi lemak and you want to scan a QR code and you pay for nasi lemak. The payment fake or fraud has gone so, so, how should I say? Um, crazy to a certain extent that you know what happens when you scan someone and you show you right you scan and say hey i paid your pay your two ringgit and they, they walk off right we have seen even fraud in those kind of payment where they show it's actually not the receipt that they have scanned you can try and say so they have a copy of some previous receipts right because when you go into a pasamala or something you know, what does a seller normally do? They want to sell and quickly get away to the next, next sales, right? So it's gotten so crazy that people fake those receipts just as though they are scanning, show, and they just walk away. Because, I mean, from a phone, unless a person really scrutinizes it, oh, you pay me my two ringgit 50 cents to my name, right? Those things happen in the, in the simplest form of, of you know, uh, payment fraud and so on and so forth. So I think we continuously try to uh, evolve right and innovate to this. For example, how do we help solve this one problem? And it's been a hit ever since. You know, if you notice, sometimes when you go to certain places, you buy something, we have a box there that calls out. You, you know that, right? Uh, it's very funny uh, voice, right? It tells you that the merchant had received two, two ringgit 45 cents, right? And actually, some merchants really like that because they, this whole thing about fraud payments and things like that goes away. Because when you scan, it does tell you receive two ringgit 45 cents from touching your e wallet. Right? So no more having to show and things like that. So, so my, my point is, for us, the most important thing for, for us dealing with this money is always be in the forefront, right? To be as quick as possible to, re, to react to this and come up with innovations to be able to help these things. Um, again, data bridges, like I say, as, as of now, we are good, right? Uh, no, no, no issue so far. Do you want to take the other question? Wow, there's so many coming out right now, pop, pop, pop. <laughs> 
Uh, what TNG do in curbing e-wallet being used as e-wallet mu and adhere to? Ooh, that's a mouthful. Um, to, okay, if I may split this into two, uh, let me talk about the AMLA first. That's actually the easier one, actually. Um, from an AMLA perspective, uh, again, if you don't know, Touching Your E-Wallet is governed by Bank Nagara, so we are EMI. So we follow exactly the AMLA regulations for, um, from Bank Nagara, right? Uh, the partners that we work with, for example, CIMB, Principal Trust Funds, and so on and so forth, for all our financial services, whilst we do our AMLA under EMI governance, when we channel this user to the banks, to, to uh, so on and so forth, they again do their own AMLA as well, right? AMLA, we are governed similar to all the FIs in this country, right? That's a fact. Um, Mule account, that's a very interesting one. Uh, and, and we are actually one of the participants together with uh, Bank Nagara to, to, to have this task force about fraud and, and so on and so forth in this country. Um, Mule account, unfortunately, is very difficult. We are, I wouldn't say we are catching up, but it's really something that we continuously monitor. Because, you know, if you don't know Mule, Mule is essentially someone who's willing to sell their account, right? Sell their identity. Unfortunately, I do an EKYC, uh, so and so. I let this account be utilized by someone else. And in most cases, it's either to siphon money. Uh, in most cases, it's either to fraud money, actually, right? So on and so forth. Um, it's not the easiest, as I always want to say, because it's mu. It's intentionally giving to someone else. Uh, again, without spilling too much beans, um, although we cannot curb the act of mu account, what we do curb is to have risk rules on people, right? If I see you suddenly, for example, coming in as a um, first-time user, suddenly there's you know, money coming in, money going out straight away, for example, these are the things that we will, from a risk perspective, block the usage and then we investigate, right? Uh, unfortunately, I don't think there is a way to curb meal origination, but it's important to be able to curb the transaction that happens. So yes, maybe one transaction will slip through for us to be able to detect, but thereafter, we can stop it from there. And we have been quite successful in doing that as well. Right? So I will not uh, kid anyone. We cannot curb meal, but we need to curb the transaction that's happening on the meal account. Okay, thanks, Desmond. Okay, so a lot of risk questions have been addressed to Desmond, so let's put the heat on Ken. Um, what's the risk of, uh, not the investment risk, but the use of technology uh, you know, to invest using like robo-advisors, you know, like, like Stash, what's the risk there, the technological risk? Okay, so apart from market risk, FX risk, all the typical investment risks, I think that uh, <clears throat> there's, there's tech risk, obviously, but, but we do what we can to keep people's data and money safe. And if you really ask me if I fully understand what goes behind all the scenes, I don't, but I have info, info security people to help me with that. Um... I will try and dodge the question by saying that it's the behavior of the, the user itself. If you look at how apps are designed these days, it's, it's very advanced, right? Like the, there's a lot that goes into how an app looks, where the red buttons are, where all the exit buttons are, where all the buy, all, the, uh, the, all those decision making. So as you use the app, if you just click on everything that an app wants you to do, you have to ask yourself, is that the right thing for you? An app will try and shape your behavior. For us, it's about long-term, being calm. You know, that's why we use you know, nice colors and everything to make everyone feel safe and nice big green buttons to make everyone feel like they're making the right choice. If you go on an e-commerce platform or a, or a stock trading platform, you will notice that it's very similar because they just want you to buy, they want you to sell, you, you do it many times a day. So it's ultimately in your fingers, right? Sometimes you don't really look at what you are agreeing to before you buy and sell. So be aware of the design and what it's trying to manipulate you to do. And I would say actually, you know, there's this function where you hide the apps and all that, right? So like, or notifications. You turn off notifications or certain things, so be much more disciplined in terms of your usage. Um, so that's that's one key risk. I would say is the user risk as it relates to the interface of the technology. Hey, thanks. I think that sort of uh, answers how can we distinguish between a scam and a legitimate investment uh, investing app. But 
you know, I would like to, to, to continue on with this conversation. And Peter, from your perspective, right, with the rise of online financial scams, what are the warning signs that students and young adults should look out for before they start using a financial app? Um, I think first thing is that in terms of app, do not ever download it via some link that people send to you. So let's say if someone sends you a message, say, hey, please download this stash away or touch and go via this link. Nine or ten, it's, you know, <laughs> yeah, scamish, right? So uh, that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, it's not so much of the app itself, but uh, technology is being used as a convenient to scam people. For example, um, my particular brand uh, is being used a lot for dividend investing scam. Uh, not just my brand, uh, even UOB and, and, and whatever banks out there, you can see suddenly there's an ad, they'll put their CEO out there. At one point, even ministers were being used. Uh, but Meta was smart enough to respond to it when it's a minister. But when you're not a minister, then you complain, then they don't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so what they do is that usually they will uh, put you into a chat group, you know, uh, I think in the past, the trend was they would offer you returns on a monthly basis. They will tell you that, hey, this is some sort of an investment fund. We have some traders in Vietnam, Myanmar, or whatever country in the world. Uh, the return is about 3 to 4% uh, a month. Now, do notice that all these scammers are actually very, very intelligent. So they will actually slowly find out what do you not fall for and evolve. For example, in the past, this kind of scam, generally, you are talking about they'll offer 15% a month. Fantastic. After that, people realize that 15% a month is not realistic, right? So they don't fall for it anymore. So the next trend was it became 3% a month, 1.5% a month. Now it sounds much more reasonable, right? They tell you that they're trading Forex, they're trading ABCD, EFG. Well, it sounds much more reasonable. Then they explain to you, let's say 1 million, you know, just that 1%, I just need to do one or two trades. It makes sense. Okay, it makes sense. Now, <clears throat> uh, so it, it becomes more real. These days, they come in different forms. Some of them, they'll add you in a group today, uh, especially those that use uh, uh, my brand as a scam. I think the star did an expose about it. Uh, I myself joined in to some of the groups. They don't scam you immediately. What they do is that they, they use very famous people's name. Uh, like for example, at one point when I joined in, uh, the group is organized by Warburg Pinkers. Wow. Right? And it's the CIO that gives lessons about how to invest. <laughs> and when you look up the name, it is the CIO with this picture, right? <clears throat> then what would they do is, they will keep educating you for a very long period of time. Eventually, one day, they will ask you to either invest or either some of them will say, hey, why not you buy an investment insurance with us? Yeah, so different, different kind of ways. Now, all of it, the point is that it makes it sound very believable. Yeah. So that is one of the things. Now, next thing is this. One of the common telltale traits, like I say, is uh, eventually they will ask you for money. So first thing is that any legit investment business will never ask you for money over WhatsApp. Never. Yeah? Never ever. And when you bank in money, it will never be an offshore account. It will always be a local, registered, you know, Malaysia Bank Negara with a proper name. Yeah. Because uh, it's much more tighter. They can't go and register a, a May Bank, St. Bahat. Definitely going to flag, right? So the name has to be a bit odd. Yeah. So once you find a name a little bit odd, please be very careful. Second thing is that if anyone tells you to, to, to use anything that is in related to I hope I don't get sued for this. Uh, meta, uh, not Meta, Meta, it's a Meta Trader, right? Uh, I think a lot of people have probably downloaded it before. Uh, for, it, it is actually a proper platform. So they are actually kind of like an information provider and a graph, kind of like trading view. But what happened is that uh, a lot of bad actors uses their service to create their scam apps. And they are well known for one thing, being loose in checking. So because of that, a lot of people took advantage of it. And many of those scamish related ones tend to use this platform simply because they are much more loser in the way that they check what's legit and what's not. 
right? So usually when anyone tell me they are in this particular investment and they ask me to, they say, hey, you know what, then once they open the app, they show me is that one, right? For me, 9.5 or 10 times is a scam, no matter what they say. <laughs> so these are some of the telltale trades. Uh. So just remember that. Uh, the truth is, if you hear any investment that gives you such a good return, just remember this one thing. Big companies like BlackRock will have kept it for themselves, package it into a unit trust and sell it to you, okay? You will not get an access to it. Yeah. Uh, except cryptocurrency, lah. But also means that you get to lose, uh, <laughs> as much. Uh. Yeah, so that's all I have to say about taking note of investment scams. Okay, I, I think we are fast. Oh, okay. A question? Hello? A very good evening to our fellow panelists and everyone present. My name is Aisha Farya. You may call me Aisha. I am a student from UITM and I pursued a diploma in investment analysis and I continued um, pursuing a bachelor's degree in finance. So today I'm here with some of my fellow batchmates and I'm interested to bring back about the main topic of our session as of right now, which is students and technology. So I was wondering, a quick question is, how can emerging technologies be leveraged to enhance financial literacy and management skills among students, particularly those from underserved communities? That is all for me. Thank you. Uh, Desmond? Well, that's a tough one. Um, how does technology help uh, underserved, especially the underserved? Um, I think first and foremost, I think a lot have been spoken about uh, safety, risk, and so on and so forth. I think that's pr primarily the first thing uh, that everyone, not just underserved, um, should take note of. Make sure when you are doing anything that's money-driven, that you always go to a proper, reliable, regulated uh, channel. Okay, so that's definitely number one, right? Um, unfortunately, what we have seen in my space is that, uh, and, and so back in my, my previous life, a lot of these things happen, uh, unfortunately, in the underserved area as well, because education is poor, right? In, in a sense, education meaning the whole access to, back then, right? Back, uh, access to information and things like that is not uh, as plentiful. But these days, you only need really two things, internet, smartphone. Right, to be able to access a little bit more wealth of information. Right? So I think not just underserved, everyone should get themselves educated to a certain extent. Okay? Um, I don't believe you need to have a master's degree in finance and things like that to be able to understand certain uh, simple terms in invest, investing. I really think it's still un fundamentally the person themselves. Um, what, what, what I meant by this is, you know, some people, you know, back in my previous life, the rich people, they get rich by doing business. And you know what's the funny thing? 80 plus percent of them only have fixed deposits. Only. Right? But their money source is from their business, for example. Right? So it doesn't mean that rich people know how to invest. Okay? So my point is about being educated in these things. Use technology to access. And I would also urge that you use technology to access and take advantage of how things are right now because it's democratized. Okay? Again, underserved, I would take that definition to maybe not the wealthier of, of, of people, right? But I think being able to put 10 ringgit, 20 ringgit as a start every month for investment is doable these days, right? Unlike, un unlike previous days, right? So those few items that we should think about, being educated as much as possible, understanding it, if you are worried about it, make sure always go to something that's regulated, right? By any uh, uh, regulators, is well known and things like that. Um, there's a wealth of information. Even simple things like unit trust, you know, in a very simple manner, they also tell you last seven years average, right? How much return and so on and so forth. It's, everything is very factual, right? And it also tells you where is it investing in, which basket, which company, which uh, you know, country and so on and so forth, right? So if you ask me. Um, this segment or people who have not started investing, I would actually encourage you all to start investing in the simpler things like a fixed income fund, right? That, you know, you can put it in, you would probably not lose money, 
but you, of course you won't earn the 20, 15% and things like that because it's not supposed to be so volatile, right? But it gives you the 5%. Start from there, right? Um, and, you know, surround yourself with this kind of information, um, not to get information overload, obviously, as well. But, you know, surround yourself with these things. Start and, and monitor as well, right? And educate yourself. Um, obviously, I won't say uh, straight away jump into things like Bitcoin and things like that. There's, I, and again, personal view is definitely not the best thing to do. Um, I would say don't jump into fat, you know, what's fashionable of the day. Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not so good at that, but I don't think things like NFT is still very popular these days. But, you know, a year or two back, everything is an F NFT, football, la, this, la, portrait. La. But, you know, again, it's not wrong, but as someone that is from that segment of underserved, not so educated in the investment space, don't try to follow fashion in that sense, you know, the fashion investment. That's probably my few cents. Yeah. Can, I think, yeah. Can I just hijack this, right? Because uh, I feel like I'm in this space a little bit uh, in terms of empowering. Uh, at least that's how I feel. Uh, huh? <laughs> Actually, it's entertainment. Uh, huh? Yeah. Um, what I want to say is that uh, with, with technology, it really empowers the people because when it comes to financial management, it all starts with the awareness of importance of finance. Uh, like I say, I have the privilege of growing up in a poor family. I understand that um, money becomes a topic that is very different from a rich family talking about it and very different from a poor family talking about it. Uh, when you do not have the money, you do not understand how it works. And that's why one of the best finance book out there that started a lot of people was Rich Dad Poor Dad, right? Talking about that uh, as much as the person right now today, yeah, it's a different story, but the book itself does offer very, very good knowledge, yeah? Um, and in the past, books was the way to learn. Mentorship was the way to learn. Technology bridges that. With a smartphone in your hand, you get the mentors from everywhere all around the world, yeah? Um, in Malaysia, yeah, I, I, I guess I can say I'm one of those who provides such an entertainment, yeah? Um, and however, I think there's a role to play for both sides. Uh, number one, definitely algorithm-wise, here's a bit of the technology side. Uh, hopefully it doesn't bore you all. Uh, a lot of people actually do ask me this question. Hey, Peter, I haven't seen you producing any video, right? Actually, that's not true. I make video every week. Do you know why you don't know? Because... Maybe if you are interested in finance because you click one video today, but generally you are not interested. It's just that day my video somehow caught your attention. The rest of the videos that have served to you for the remaining week, after two weeks of not clicking, they will not serve you any similar video. Because today, the technology in your, in your hand, the social media, is actually very polarizing. It makes you to be a very extreme person. What do I mean by that? If today you like chairs, you're going to find your social media feed is all about chairs. It's nothing else except chairs. And it builds this idea in your brain that everyone loves chairs. So you're going to walk up to your friend, if you're naive enough, you're going to walk up to your friend and say, hey, do you see the beautiful chair that's all over social media? And then your friend is like, how much chair are you talking about? I only see, uh, I only see cars, because his feet is all about cars. Right? Yeah. And, and that's a problem. It's very different from those days when there was a newspaper, when you're forced to flip every single page and that forces you to learn things that you're not that interested in but it gives you a chance to explore things that you may not know you are interested in. Now, so that's where I think technology, while giving us access, actually made it worse for us to learn today as much as I'm in that space. Number two, I, I shouldn't, uh, uh, yeah, but for most of the financial brand out there, which I think in the past, they, do, they, they are very good, they understand. Huh? I'll say this first. Uh, the more the people are educated about finance, the more likelihood they'll turn into your customer. Agree? Right? Yeah, that's how it works. Yeah. But the unfortunate truth about a lot of management, I, I hope my sponsors all don't scold me later. Yeah, they are very nice. They are also my clients before. Yeah, at least we are all. <laughs> so I will, I will put it there, right? Um, now, my point is that sometimes when I work with certain brands and I work with certain financial institutions, all they care is about whether does the money come in. So what does it mean? When you're talking about empowering students who have no money, do they have money? 
You're not the target market. So what's the point of educating you? But sometimes that's where they miss out. Because one day you'll be rich. One day you'll be doing fine. One day you'll have the money invest. But when, when management of banks and so on, or financial institutions who are not willing to spend the money invest in education, simply because they don't see the chance of getting that return, they will miss out a big pie. I still recall when I was young, definitely one of our first experience during my time was a Tiger brand, Tiger branded uh, <laughs> a bank. Yippee, remember? Yeah, that was my first bank account. I remember until today, and I always say this one thing, right? Um, even until today, I use a Maybank bank account. Not because they treat me better, but just simply because I had the Tiger tabung that I'm so used to, right? And I became a loyal customer until today. Yeah, so you get what I mean, right? So um, I think both sides of the spectrum have that responsibility to educate the people through education. Now, when I'm saying all this, I also want to highlight, I'm not asking for sponsorship. Yeah. Uh, what I mean is just simply, I think there needs to be much more awareness that education builds, builds your customer and therefore ultimately for the business end, it gives you more business. And for audience out there, if you're just scrolling on social media, please remember, scroll things that you're not interested in as well so that you have the chance to learn things outside of your comfort zone. Okay, uh, well, thanks. Ken, you've been very quiet. So I'm going to give you the last words unless the two of you have something to say. No. Cannot. Okay. So, uh, final question. Uh, I, I saw a very interesting question there. What are the three financial apps that are on your phone? And what final pieces of advice would you give a 20-year-old who's about to start his or her personal finance journey? I do have three. Uh, stash away. Stash away. What's the third one? Uh? Stash away. Uh, I, I, use, uh, I use Luno as well. I honestly haven't used any of the stock trading apps because I'm not a stock trader. Um, yeah, and I have, I have a few, fair few uh, e-wallets, but I use Touch and Go the most. You guys beat Grab. I don't know how, but you beat, for me, la, you, you guys beat Grab already. So, yeah, I don't use too many, and you don't need too many, to be honest. Um, pick something you like and you're comfortable with, you feel like you're fully educated about, and just stick with it. My advice for the 20-year-old is just to, to start, right? I, I think in this day and age, you have no excuse. One barrier that's been taken away is that, oh, I know money to invest. Last time I believe, but now 10, 50 bucks. Behind your couch or so, I'm pretty sure you can find like, like 50 bucks already. So there's no excuse in terms of, of no money. When people tell me these days, I have no money, it means they don't like my face. Everyone has at least 50 bucks, 100 bucks to invest these days. So that's, that's not an excuse anymore. But I think if you start early, what you will learn is that you will learn about yourself as an investor. What are your behaviors? When do you get too excited? When do you get too fearful? All these things will be very useful when you progress through life, progressively earn more, and ultimately uh, set yourself up for, for a very good financial future. Um, I also want to make you aware or scare you a bit that your dreams are very expensive. Right? Whatever you think about you know, the overconfidence, behavioral bias thing is very real. Everything is very expensive. You know the, the adage, Siki Siki Lama Lama Jadi Bukit, right? I'm very against that because it ain't enough in this day and age. Siki Siki Lama Pun, just very little, Can, nothing. It's too little. You have to retire at least with one million. You know how hard it is to get one million in your retirement fund? It's very hard. Only half a percent of Malaysian EPF contributors one, half a percent, not even one percent, half a percent have more than one million. A house this day in KL, God, can you find something decent less than a million? Of course you can borrow, but then 100,000 down payment? 100,000? No? Kids' education, you guys are, have been, been put through a very good education. Just now, Peter said 400,000. Sure, if you want to go overseas, one million. And climbing, it's all very expensive. And so, my message to you, now that I've scared you a little bit, is that where you invest is only half the equation. The other half is you. You contributing capital, your own money, you contributing your own time to let it compound, and then the investment part 
let us take care of it. All this together, then you have a shot at something that is something that you'll be proud of. I think switch your, your expectation on investment, not into something that will just vault you into like vast amounts of wealth that you're so fabulously wealthy, you don't need to think about anything anymore. Think about it as like just something to help you reach what you want. You know, sometimes you just need a bit of a ladder to reach that, that shelf. Sometimes you just need to go a bit faster to get past that yellow light. Investment is there, but you are doing most of the heavy lifting. Okay, so rely on yourself. Don't rely on, uh, you know, don't hope for government to save you all the rest. Rely on yourself. And I wish you guys all the best. Okay, on that inspiring note. <laughs> So we have covered a lot of ground uh, from the basics of financial management. I didn't come empty-handed. As a <laughs> fintech company, I'm legally obligated to give promo codes. So here it is. It's not limited time only. This is my personal invitation for you. When you come into a little bit of money, pull up this, share with your friends. It's not a limited time thing, so do your research first. Watch Mr. Money's review on Stash Away. And when you come into a bit of money or um, you want to try it out, uh, do scan this QR code. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, uh, Ken. So as I said, we've uh, covered a lot of ground. Um, there's one last slider question. Let's see how much uh, the audience have retained. Um, can we see the answer for that? Right. Uh, convenience. Well. Sounds good, right? Um, so well done to everybody uh, for retaining um, you know, everything that our esteemed panelists have uh, shared with us. Uh, I hope this has inspired everyone to take that first step, especially the students. Um, just want to share a little bit about uh, what I did as a student. Um, I used to save 20 ringgit a month, right? With whatever allowances that my parents gave me. Um, and I still do it till today. And I think you know, it's something that has really helped me out. So maybe a little bit different uh, perspective from Ken, the sikit sikit jadi bukit. Uh, I totally believe in that. All right, so. Sorry, I, I, I have to say something. I've been biting my lips. Um, I do agree and disagree as well, um, and to the students especially. Uh, probably you want to break that, that, that statement into two. Um, the second part I won't touch on, but I, I do want to touch on sikit sikit, right? do start with a sikit sikit, right? Because investment at this day and age don't need the banyak banyak, right? It's really the sikit sikit. Whether you become a bouquet, that's really ultimately up to you and your behavior and so on and so forth. But don't be afraid to start with the sikit sikit. I just want to make sure I say that point, thanks. And can I pass this back to the MC? So oh. thank you very much to the organizers and uh, a big clap for yourself as well for staying to this hour. <laughs>